So when you're generating fire for certain productions, you can go uh, one of several ways really. You can generate a real fire um, using logs or coals, um, but that's uh, generally shied away from because uh, it's less controllable and also continuity over over shots needs to remain the same. You know, you can take an entire day to film a scene, yet the fire needs to look like it's only happened over a course of a couple of minutes. So kind of controlling a fire like that using ceramic logs or ceramic coals, say, um, with, with gas, what's normally normally produced. So we'd have propane bottles uh, running through a, a gas pipe into either certain kind of outlets like fishtails or flame bars. Uh, or even into just little braziers um, or fire pits and things like that. So you'd use um, fake logs, uh, uh, wadding, vermiculite to give you a, a kind of base and then you'd have a gas pipe inside and you just simply light the gas as it comes out. It can, it can stay to a set level throughout the day then. Or in smaller shots you can use flammable liquids like IPA or a lamp oil that will burn directly. Obviously you need to have tighter controls over using that. Now you do need to keep uh, very safe while using any form of fire, even just small candles. Um, so full fire kit and fire extinguishing kit will be on standby. For the larger fire kind of pyres we were doing, we had the kind of large vessels of water standing by that we could quickly douse the uh, fire with if needs be. A few problems arose while doing a pyre on a triple SI site because uh, we could only use seawater. Uh, it was about a uh, 250 meters to the to the sea thankfully you know we weren't in the middle of nowhere we were um, on the beach at least um, but pumping the seawater and the effects it would have on all the equipment uh, thereafter you know for fire generally you know, you know staying safe with it either gas or flammable liquids uh, keeping it set to a level throughout the day that is required and there's numerous ways that you can create smoke uh, on production like this you can go from small levels of AB smoke which will are kind of like a chemical smoke into larger exterior runs of huge swathes of fog for an exterior effect um, but the, the key is to understand the smoke and, the, and what you're trying to achieve for the different situations. So when you're, when you're inside either in a studio or as we were inside a large marquee just close to location and doing interior hazing you'd use a a haze machine or other kind of interior smoke machines to give you that bit of atmosphere and just to make the candle lights really kind of sing and give them something to reflect off or even going so much as to into Ely Cathedral doing large atmospheric uh, smoke inside there and really just using the light coming through the, the stained glass windows uh, it was really beautiful but you know that wouldn't necessarily be seen without that level of atmos and then you can go into the exterior machines like the Artem handheld machine or the medium burners and you can go various sizes up from those um, uh, running into lay flat tubing and, uh, and you know large kind of pickup truck sized smoke machines for huge swathes of smoke or whatever you're doing. This is the uh, Artem exterior. So basically you have a small propane bottle which powers a burner inside and heats up a coil here. Uh, the Artem smoke fluid goes through the coil uh, and where it evaporates and then condenses as it's released at the end, creating the smoke. Nice and uh, light, manoeuvrable, run up and down hills with it. As long as you keep the coil warm enough, uh, all your fluid should burn at the appropriate rate. White smoke. See how, how much the wind affects it <laughs> and what it does to it. But invariably, when you're on a shoot, the camera has to be way down there. So, this is what we call a medium smoke machine. Same basic principles. Uh, except uh, on a slightly larger scale. So we're really looking on getting as much, much higher volume of smoke output on these. Normally you 
need to tie the end down or get it pinned down or something. But in this instance, very short little run. Place like that. Walk along. Lay flat, you can get various colours. You can get it clear like this stuff, uh, black, green, uh, grey. I'm using clear here just to show you what the smoke's doing as it as it channels down there. You'll be able to see it a lot better. So yeah, you can uh, you can have these running 200, 300, uh, even you know several machines a couple of hundred meters each you can uh, cover vast swathes of land and uh, expanse and just from one machine one place you're doing wind on a production like this uh, again it can be differences between an inside uh, setup and an outside obviously uh, using inside you can safely use electrical wind machines which can uh, get the, the quieter effects you know soft hair blowing or uh, uh, clothing blowing like that and uh, they're nice and quiet so uh, you don't have to worry about sound whereas filming on an exterior location if you're doing certainly high powered wind you need things like uh, petrol driven wind machines using those machines outside you know you really have to contend with not only are you disrupting sound but also they're much larger machines much more powerful you have to be safe with not only your own crew's uh, hearing and the running of the machine and uh, uh, but also the other cast and crew I can only remember really primarily using an exterior uh, petrol driven wind machine for one of the second unit shots which was the horses were really fighting against their reins against their tie posts and uh, it was for during the scene of the murdering of uh, King Duncan uh, it was heavy rain lots of wind really um, but apart from that throughout the rest of production I think that what you see in terms of wind and in terms of levels and the gales that were happening was was the real stuff so doing rain uh, for a production like Macbeth was difficult in itself uh, just because of the location. You know, you're out in the middle of mountainous ranges in, in Scotland which were providing plenty of rain themselves uh, or in certain other areas and exterior locations in and around the Inverness set. Uh, so we set up large reservoirs, uh, collapsible reservoirs for, for water storage basically and we had approximately 60,000 litres there. We'd run large petrol driven pumps uh, drawing directly out of these reservoirs to feed our, our rain bars and rain stands. But the key is when you're filming this rain is to make it look realistic. A lot of the rain you generally see on film or you would generally see kind of in real life uh, may not be able to be picked up on, on, on camera because it's uh, either too light or it's it's not lit properly. So uh, doing those, those kind of effects for camera, uh, you really have to get them correct. It's very easy to make it look fake as with any effect really. Um, and the, the, in that sense, you know, you're still you're still fighting things like the wind and the re weather themselves. You know, you're dealing with not only are you you putting in a lot of water down on the ground themselves, but you know, if it's raining anyway, uh, you're looking at excess kind of ground level water. You're dealing with uh, uh, wet and uh, kind of muddy equipment, and it can quickly become into you know the area you're shooting in. And certainly, if it's a, a muddy area in itself. You know, can quickly become a kind of quagmire that uh, everyone's battling against and no one likes to get rained on anyway you know, <laughs> it's something that generally uh, irks a lot of the cast and the crew but you know freezing cold water there are some things we can do to warm them up but we're really limited to uh, the volume of water we're putting in and the uh, the location that we're doing it in um, sometimes they, they've just got to get wet So creating snow and ash for a production like Macbeth, um, early on we were asked to supply these uh, what we call snow sticks or snow candles. They're uh, little sticks about yay big and they burn and create a, a really nice floating ash that will drift along with the wind um, and give you either a snowy effect or if, if you're doing say a house fire, um, a, a, a burning ash say or floating particles like that. For the burning of Dunsinane wood um, we were asked to really 
for that scene to generate a lot of candles, I think. You know, and I went through nearly 500 candles over the couple of days shooting. And that's, that's a hell of a lot, um, really. The, uh... Of course, Sethits can be quite a wide department, um, covering quite a few areas, from actual pieces that are applied to the actors, to prop heads or rigs that are applied to someone like the gut rig. Um, or a severed hand rig. Um, yeah, so it covers quite a, a broad range. We provided quite a few realistic silicon pieces for the film. Um, so once we've taken a live cast off of the actor, we'll then pour a cast in silicon, so you'll have to match the colour of the silicon to the actor's skin. You then need to remove the seams, um, so you'll trim them off and then have to fill them in with silicon. Um, to smooth it over so it doesn't look like it's just come out of a mould and then that will go through to being painted so it'll get passed over to us art workers who will then paint it with silicon and oil um, in lots of different layers with airbrushes and by flicking in order to replicate flesh um, and then the last thing is hair punching so either hair punching a head of hair or um, placing in eyebrows and eyelashes and then some facial hair as well. Um, Tristan was in charge of making replica eyes for some of our pieces um, so that involves um, taking photos of the actors and then actually making the eye so you'll pour a resin, hand paint it or print a copy off in acetate of the iris and the pupil and then place that on top of the resin and then pour clear resin over the top of that to get a nice shiny eye and that's buffed and then placed into the silicon head to make it look as realistic as possible. One of my favourite pieces that we made was our double for David Fulis for his death scene um, which was for one very fun to make and to shoot on the day and also it was quite a big compliment on the day um, knowing that our piece was being used more than it was originally intended um, because they thought it looked so realistic. So David was actually able to step off of set for that day and we carried on shooting with our double, which was, which was quite a good feeling. Another piece we made was a head slice um, for when Paddy in a scene has to swing a sword and hit one of our extras around the head, obviously causing a cut. So that involved me ducking down under camera with a line and a syringe ready to pump blood um, with Paddy swinging the sword above my head just about missing me. Um, so that was quite a fun one to shoot. It can be quite tough on our actors um, when they have to wear pieces. Uh, for example, our severed hand rig. Um, the actor had to have his arm concealed behind his back um, with a makeshift straight jacket. And then obviously the piece is quite heavy on the shoulder. And when you have to wear that for quite a few hours on end, it does become quite uncomfortable. So you have to really look after them and make sure they're doing okay and take regular breaks. Um, sometimes you have to take the piece off of them so they can just stretch out. So it's important to make the piece adjustable um, and quick release so that they can get out and get moving and then get them back into the piece as quickly as possible, ready for camera.